Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent, all of us were disgusted with the Brett Kavanaugh hearings as candidate for the Supreme Court. It reflected how low our society has descended in its divisiveness and its polarization over any and every issue. Red, blue, Democrat, Republican, old, young, rich, poor, differences in sexual identity, different races, nationalities, cultures, religion. Whatever happened to the United States of America, the United People of America? E pluribus unum, out of many, one. One nation under God, indivisible. United we stand, divided we fall. I think it was so appropriate and very timely that Alan Hilton was here last weekend as our guest, talking about how the church can save our country and the world by teaching people the way of Jesus, which is the way of living together in unity, even though there is a lot of diversity. That which unites us as Christians, as Americans, as citizens of the world should be greater than whatever it is that divides us, our opinions, our, our points of view. Only we've let it get backwards and we've let that which divides us become greater than that which unites us. Our Judeo-Christian values are all about community, about God's people living together in community, caring for one another, sharing with one another, helping one another, serving one another, loving one another. In the Old Testament, part of the Bible, we are told how the people of Israel live together in community, always there for one another. And the Ten Commandments were the rules that guided that community. In the New Testament, we are told how the followers of Jesus, the early church, lived together in community. In the scripture passages we heard this morning, from the book of Acts and Corinthians, we are reminded again. I want you to hear those passages again and think about them. In Acts chapter two, we are told that all who believed were together <clears throat> and held all things in common, sharing everything with each other. They would sell their possessions and divide with those in need. They worshiped together, they worked together, they ate their meals together. In chapter four, it goes on to say, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one claimed private ownership or any possessions, but everything they owned they held in common. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold to be distributed among those in need. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we read about the early church. It says, God so put the body together that there would be no dissension within the body, but the members would have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all of them suffer together. If one member rejoices, they all rejoice and celebrate together. One other example of how we are meant to live together in unity and in community can be seen in the prayer that we pray every Sunday morning, the Lord's Prayer. We pray, our Father, not my Father. Give us today our daily bread, not give me today my daily bread. And last week, and Alan Hilton reminded us that Jesus prayed another prayer that he thinks ought to be repeated and prayed together in the church just as often as the Lord's Prayer. And I personally agree with him. 
He reminded us how in John 17, the night before Jesus was, was crucified, that he prayed to the Father that all of his followers, and that includes you and me today, would be one, would be united together. Why? So that the world might believe. I mean, how can the world believe in one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Holy Spirit, if Jesus' followers are all divided? And of course, that was the desire that led to the, the formation of our Christian church, as we call it, to begin with to unite everybody as Christians, not have different Methodists, Baptists, Catholics, Episcopalians, just Christians together in Christ. So our religious faith tells us very clearly that God wants all of God's people, and that includes all the people of the world, to live together in unity and in community and not be divided and fighting one another. But we've clearly lost that value in our society today. We've lost that blessing that God wants for us. And not only have we lost it in religion, but we've lost it in politics and economics and education in all the ways that we live, every way you can imagine. We've become divided people. Our nation, let alone our world, is anything but one caring, sharing community. And it's reflected not only in our national politics, but it's reflected in our lack of neighborhoods today. Another one that affects all of us. When I was a boy growing up, I lived in a neighborhood where everybody knew each other. And if we didn't know our neighbors personally, the lady that lived in that house, we knew about her and she knew about us. And all the kids in the neighborhood played together and everyone looked out for each other. And I could walk to and from school over a mile each way and my parents didn't have to worry about anything bad happening to me. On weekends, on Saturday morning, I would jump on my bike after breakfast and take off and be gone the whole day until supper time at six o'clock, going wherever I wanted to go. And my parents didn't worry about me. And if I did anything bad that I shouldn't be doing, one of the neighbors would call my parents and let them know. And I had to worry about that one. But we have lost that sense of community and neighborhood today. Most parents I know wouldn't let their children out by themselves on the street, even on the block where they live for fear of something bad happening. Or also maybe a fear of some neighbor calling up social services and saying there's an abused child being left out in the street by himself or herself. Now Clay is always recommending good books for you to read, so I think I have the right to do the same thing. Here's the book that I want to recommend to you today. The book is entitled Grounded by Diana Butler Bass. It's a book about finding God and finding community in a world that has so radically changed today. And one of the things that uh, Diana Bass points out in this book is how human beings from the very beginning have always been drawn to other people who are like themselves and banded together in common purpose. And that common purpose usually means mutual support as well as security. And that's a good thing. I mean, think about it. There is no village or city or state or nation or country that could survive if the people didn't band together. That's why it's so important in, for God's people in both the Old Testament and the New Testament to live together in community. But where this gets into trouble is when these strong ties and this desire to be among people that are like I am mutates into exclusion and conformity. It becomes less than a good thing when one group of like 
people begin to think that others who are not like them are not as good as they are. And eventually that leads them to think they must be my enemies because they're not like me. And that's what Jesus dealt with all the time as we read about what Jesus did in the, in the New Testament. He was breaking down the dividing walls of hostility that existed between people, between Jews and Samaritans, between Jews and Gentiles, between the rich and the poor, the social outcasts, those who were physically impaired and the rest of society. And this is what we need to do today where everybody has become so divided and so polarized, treating each other as enemies. We need to get rid of this divisiveness. It's got to start somewhere, and if it doesn't start in the church, where else is it going to start? Those Brett Kavanaugh hearings were one of the worst demonstrations of this I've ever seen in my lifetime. In her book, Grounded, Diana Butler Bass points out how one of the oldest meanings of the word religion is to bind back together. Bind back that which connects us with God and, and that which connects us with one another. Over the centuries and especially during the last few decades, we've lost that meaning of religion. And instead, we speak of religion today only in terms of institutions or organizations or structures. But you know, the future of Christianity and the church depends upon our ability to regain the real meaning of religion, binding us together with God and to one another, being united rather than divided. And if we can succeed in modeling that in the church, then maybe that can help us turn our politics and economics and every other area of our divided life around, away from it's all about me to it's all about we. Not me, but we. I meet each Wednesday morning at 6 a.m with a group of men here at the church. And I've met with men's groups for almost 50 years now. But I've got to say that this is the most interesting, diverse, strongly opinionated and intelligently informed group I've ever known. They all know all the answers to everything. <laughs> but the challenge is half of them are conservative, theologically, politically, socially, and half of them are liberal. Wednesday, a week ago, two members of that group, our group got into its usual free-for-all, shouting, yelling, debating over diverse points of view. And if we'd been anywhere but in the church, I'm sure it would have descended into a free-for-all brawl. But two members in particular really got going at it, passionately disagreeing with each other over what they believed. But I couldn't help but notice that after the meeting ended, those two men were hugging each other. They had learned over time and the process of small group building that you can be totally different. You can completely disagree with one another and yet you can still be friends. You can be more than friends. You can really care about each other. That's the kind of an example that our divided world needs to see and to learn today. God created us to live together in unity, in community, not in divisiveness. And when we learn to do that, we come to realize that our differences only enrich the community. It only adds flavor to the community. I love the phrase, the kaleidoscopic beauty of God's world. It is a beautiful world. Thank goodness that we're not all alike. And when you get to know people that are different from you, it doesn't mean you have to become like them. It doesn't mean you have to accept their point of view, but it sure does add variety and diversity and flavor to the mix. 
We need to learn, maybe beginning in Washington, if that's not a pipe dream, that we don't have to agree with each other to love each other and care for each other. And realizing that we live in an interconnected universe, that we all belong to each other, even though we are different. This is the only hope for the future of the world. It's not about me, it's about we. So we're in a new sermon series this month that's supposed to be focusing on our vision and the future for Woodmont Christian Church. And if I had to lift up that vision, I think what I've just shared with you would be a huge part of it, of what this church is all about. And Woodmont does the best job of teaching people to live together with diversity of any church I've known, but then that's what our DNA is all about. Beginning with our children, and Woodmont is blessed with an incredible number of children, we want them to learn how to live together in community with their differences rather than polarize and separate and fight with one another. And we want to do that not only for the sake of our world, but especially for the sake of those beautiful children and our grandchildren, that they will grow up in a world that doesn't destroy itself by divisiveness and hatefulness. How wonderful it is week after week to see the literally hundreds of children and youth that come to this church. And they come during the week too because of our preschool developing caring friendships, discovering a sense of community and neighborhood here in the church. Some of them are making the best friends that they will enjoy throughout their entire life, beginning right now in preschool. And they're also learning the most important values about life and what life is all about if you're to live it to the fullest. If you've never been down to the children's wing on a Sunday morning, I encourage you to go have a look but I warn you, it will be crowded. Talk to them, ask them about their best friends. Sometimes you don't even have to ask, they're holding hands with their best friends or have their arm around each other. We don't want the world to teach them divisiveness. We want Jesus Christ to teach them unity and community. Not me, but we. When I was in seminary, there was a theologian who had this idea about relationships based on I thou rather than I it. Martin Buber said that God created us to see each other as thous, not its. And thous have the possibility of affection and for mutual responsibility. But unfortunately, the ways of our world have led us to have I-it relationships in which we see others as things to be observed, examined, critiqued, even exploited rather than loved. I-it leaves no room for community because we want our children to grow up learning I-thou relationships as well as all of God's other values for life at its very best. The future vision for Woodmont has an awful lot to do with our children. And because we have been blessed with so many children, we're just flat running out of room. So a big part of our immediate future vision is adding more classrooms for our children where they can, can learn about Jesus and learn about God's basic values for life. Where else are they gonna learn that if they don't learn it here at Woodmont? As you know, the goal of this current capital campaign is $8 million and that is a whole lot of money. But thanks to the fact that some Woodmont members have not only been blessed with great resources, but also blessed with a spirit of generosity in their giving, we passed more than halfway mark on that goal before we even went public with the campaign. 
But we had to do that to test the waters among those who could make the difference to see if they were on board. And they are on board. They're excitedly on board. I've been in a lot of capital campaigns. But I've never seen one like this one. It's the most exciting, inspiring thing that I have seen. But their gifts alone are not going to make this campaign succeed unless and until the rest of us do our part, whatever that part might be, to bring about the sum total. So I am challenging you this morning that between now and November the 4th, and that's just three weeks away, to make a pledge to this campaign that challenges you. To make a pledge that shows your commitment. Commitment to Christ, commitment to this church, commitment to our children. And for some of us, that might mean making a pledge that's equal to the cost of taking your family on a safari trip to Africa. Or the cost of a brand new car whatever kind of car you drive. For others of us, it might mean making a pledge equal to the cost of taking your family to Disney World or on a ski trip. I mean, after all, which is more important for your children and our grandchildren, a trip to Disneyland or helping to build a church where they're taught week after week about the real values of life that will enable them to help create and live in a world at peace rather than in so much turmoil as it is today. But as with everything else, it will only succeed if our attitude is not me, but we. And I hope every one of you will be a part of the we. Amen.